The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your uh, copy of Scripture this morning to the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, I want to say just a word or two about uh, these uh, videos from CBF we've been seeing during our offering. Uh, you may have noticed over the last couple of weeks uh, Jade and Sheila Acker uh, in those videos. Not only uh, will money from the Global Missions Offering go directly to their work in Uganda along with Missy there, uh, but our, they are in our budget. So we support Jade and Sheila Acker uh, as direct mission partners as well. So you may hear their names uh, or see them, and they may sound familiar to you. That's where they are from Alabama, and we support them. And I hope the next time they're back stateside, maybe we can get them to come and share with us uh, in their work uh, there in Uganda. But you'll notice, too, in the bulletin there, uh, we're progressing well on our um, uh, Global Missions offering. I think we're going to fall short of that Christmas suit, though, shucks. Uh, next week, but I do hope, remember, we will be taking that offering up uh, through all of Christmas, which means uh, the last day will be January 6th when we take that offering. But let's hear now um, these words from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, then verses 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Your words. Whatever words I place in the way, God, may they be quickly forgotten. Come, Holy Spirit, shape us and call us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, during this season of Advent, I've chosen to preach from the Old Testament lessons in the Revised Common Lectionary. That's a, a sort of a ecumenical guide for scripture readings throughout the year used by uh, most churches actually outside of the Baptist tradition, but some of us Baptist folks dabble in it a bit. I think the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible, gets a bad rap sometimes because well, people often point to its sort of archaic understanding of people in the world. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes from some of the way that uh, Christians use the Old Testament as a, well, as little more than just a reservoir of proof text. Uh, they just sort of cite little passages or nuggets they know from the Old Testament, particularly from books like Leviticus. I'm always a, a bit fascinated, actually, whenever I hear someone quote or make reference to some passage from Leviticus. I mean, have you ever read it? I mean, really, it's not something you, you just read out of interest. It's pretty boring. It's pretty dry. It's even worse in Hebrew. It's mostly a super specific little list of details about what to do and what not to do, especially during rituals and feast days and holy days. Of course, whenever I do hear somebody make reference uh, to the book of Leviticus in conversations outside of a, an Old Testament seminar, uh, it's usually some reference to its 18th chapter and its specific laws about sexual regulations. Oddly enough, I never hear anyone mention uh, one line from that 
book about not offering your children to the false god Molech. I think we may overlook it, I don't know. Maybe those of us who have kids, I don't know. But you see, what's interesting to me is that's the only, those are the only verses in the whole book that get any press. The only ones that get any attention. When there's really a lot of interesting stuff going on in the book of Leviticus. A lot of stuff that may be overlooked otherwise because of this seemingly overly detailed instruction manual for ancient priests and their assistants. Take, for instance, the 11th chapter of Leviticus. Chapter 11 outlines what foods are clean or kosher and which foods are unclean. This is what verses 4 through 6 say. This is a lecture in Leviticus, so I hope you're taking notes. Among those that chew the cud or have divided hooves, you shall not eat the following. The camel, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hooves. It's unclean for you. Okay. The rock badger, hope you don't have one of those in the crock pot today. For even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hooves, it is unclean for you. The hare, or rabbit, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hooves, it's unclean for you. Fair enough, right? I don't, I don't have a hankering for camel. I don't even know if I could identify a rock badger. And I know some folks used to do it because they had to, but I have no desire to eat a rabbit or a hare. But those next words, the very next verse, the first two words, oh, they break my heart. The pig. <laughs> for even though it has divided hoofs and is cleft-footed, it does not chew the cud. It's unclean for you. Of their flesh you shall not eat. It makes me just want to not even read the Bible. Think about it. There are at least, what, three or four different types of pig you can eat for breakfast? Ham? Sausage? Pork chops? That's not, you know what's next. Bacon? Man. Mm, Lord, help me. More than likely, some of us have eaten at least one or two of those in the last 48 hours, right? Some of you probably ate it for breakfast. May even still have it in your pocket wrapped up in a towel. <laughs> but it doesn't get much better. This is what verse 10 says. Anything in the seas or the stream that does not have fins and scales of the swimming, swarming creatures in the waters and among all the other living creatures that are in the waters, they are detestable to you. And detestable they shall remain. Of their flesh you shall not eat. Can I break that down for you? Do you know what that means? Only fish with scales. Catfish has skin. No catfish. <coughs> shrimp. Shell. Man, I could eat my weight in shrimp. Probably have more than once. Both are dietary abominations. Of course, we're New Testament Christians, right? We can relax about that. We, we know the story in the 10th chapter of Acts where Peter sees a sheet coming down from heaven, got all kinds of creatures on it. He hears a voice, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, nah, man, Leviticus says I can't eat it. And God says, do you not? He says, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. But then Jesus himself in Mark's gospel says, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile since it enters not the heart but the stomach? And then, as only Jesus could say, it goes out into the sewer. And Mark, thank God, Mark puts this little parenthetical statement. And thus he declared all foods clean. So we're off the hook. We're off the hook about chapter 11. But then there's chapter 19 that comes right after Leviticus 18, particularly its 19th verse. God says to Moses, to the people, You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. Nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. That's one verse. Now, I know some of y'all have plowed a field with a mule. And I know you probably plowed that field with a mule and plowed one row for corn and the next one for okra. You're going to bust the gates of hell wide open. That's what it says. That's what it says. And woe unto you if you did it while wearing a polycotton blend. <laughs> of course, for these ancient people of Israel, these laws that seem somewhat ridiculous to us, well, they were meaningful. They were important. And for good reason, I imagine, if you had seen a pig in the ancient world, I wouldn't want to eat it either. But there it is. But 
There's some that are still really important. For instance, just two verses right before that one about not, not uh, breeding two kinds of animals and sowing two kinds of seed, it says this, You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but, and this is, maybe you've heard this before, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's right after it, right before it. There's one more interesting chapter, though, before we leave Leviticus alone. You'll never have to hear it again, at least until I bring it up next time. It's a chapter that acts as a sort of foundation for our passage in Isaiah. Really, one could argue it's a foundation for the entire ministry of Jesus. It's chapter 25 of Leviticus. And it starts this way, The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land that I am giving you, the land shall observe a Sabbath for the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in their yield. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. In other words, every seven years the people were to leave their land alone. Don't put dirt on the plow, don't break it up, don't sow seeds, don't reap a harvest, don't even pull the weeds. Leave the land alone every seventh year. Whatever just comes up naturally, you can eat that. Whatever comes up naturally, though, you don't hoard it for yourself. You share it with everyone else, including the wild animals. It's in the book. Now, what's even even wilder about that? While every farmer who's ever farmed would hear that and go, every seventh year, don't do nothing, I'm going to lose something. I'll lose income. I'll lose a harvest. And if that sounds crazy, what comes next? Well, maybe even crazier. God tells Moses to tell the people, you shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives 49 years. I'm glad I didn't take Hebrew math, right? And you shall follow the fifth, uh, hallow the 50th year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. In other words, every 50th year will be a year of jubilee, a year when every financial obligation is forgiven, when property that was previously sold or borrowed is returned, when slaves are freed, when prisoners are released, When land is allowed to rest, it's a year of joy and celebration, liberation, forgiveness, reconciliation, rest. The people of Israel, according to tradition, were given this law by Moses the first month of the second year after they came from the Exodus, around the year maybe 1450 B.C. But there's little to no evidence that they ever did it. At all. None in the Bible, at least. Now you move the clock forward to the end of the 6th century B.C. and you get to our passage uh, from what we call the third prophet in the tradition of Isaiah. He takes this imagery surrounding the idea of Jubilee and speaks to this recently liberated people of Judah, the ones who have been liberated from Babylonian captivity by the Persians. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to proclaim the year of Jubilee. The promises of Jubilee are given back to the people of God by God through the prophet. Good news to the oppressed and brokenhearted. Liberty to the captives. Release to prisoners. The year of the Lord's favor. Here it is. Here it comes. It's Jubilee coming for the people of God after years of foreign captivity and exile. And what's more, this Jubilee that's coming will be so overwhelming and wonderful, the prophet says, so thoroughly realized that all of the nations can't help but recognize the people of God by their response to this coming jubilee. Isaiah says that the descendants will be known among the nations, their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. The nations will recognize God's people by their joy in jubilee. Now that seems like a fitting claim to me, a fitting passage on the third Sunday of Advent. 
a Sunday we call Godet Sunday. Uh, Godet is the Latin word rejoice. It's a Sunday, an Advent marked by the theme of joy. And I can't help but think that the people of God experiencing Jubilee would most certainly be filled with joy. I mean, if I were to go home this afternoon after church and, and open my mailbox or, or found taped to my front door a few letters telling me that my student loans were forgiven, that my mortgage is paid, my car note is no more, why, I might just, and I know it's a sin, but I might dance. I might dance out in the street. I might walk the aisle next week, but I'm going to do it. People are going to know that my debts have been forgiven. Or what if, what if you had to sell your parents' house, the home you grew up in, to help pay for one of your parents' year or sort of end-of-life care and medical expenses? And then you went home after church today and found a certified letter with all of the proper paperwork saying, you got it back. It all came back. Well, I think you might have just a little tinge of joy, wouldn't you? If you got it all back. Or could you imagine the outcry? I think it'd be audible even here if today, right now, millions of refugees huddled in cold camps were told, you can go home. You can go home. Today, you can go home. That's what Jubilee might look like. That would most certainly capture the attention of the nations, I think. Of course, amidst all this talk about joy and jubilee, one can't help but wonder, did it ever really happen? I mean, there's not, not a lot, if any, biblical evidence suggesting that the people of Israel ever recognized the year of jubilee after the exodus and before the exile to Babylon. But surely after, right? Surely after they've been released from captivity, they'd pick it back up. But no, there's no evidence suggesting that they were exactly ready to jump on this notion, this opportunity to establish the precedent of jubilee. And I don't hear any sort of cry from the people of God now. You know what we need to do? We need to put the Christ back in jubilee. That's what, I don't hear that at all. Why not? I mean, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds pretty good to me. Release to the captives, liberation, debt forgiveness, return to home. That all sounds pretty good. It sounds good to the ones needing to be released. The ones in need of liberation and forgiveness. That's good news to the ones who want to return home. It's good news to the lowly and to the oppressed. But is it good news to the rest of us? I suppose that's why this passage of Isaiah got Jesus in so much trouble. In Luke's gospel, Jesus begins his public ministry by reading this passage from Isaiah in a synagogue in Galilee. He gets up, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah, he unrolls it, he reads it, rolls it back up, and says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they're all like, oh, that's nice. And he goes on to say, well, you don't get it. And explains it to them, and then Luke tells us, this is what they do. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the brow of a hill of which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off a cliff. Jesus reads this passage from Isaiah, and instead of everybody going, yeah, Jubilee, let's do that. No, they run him out of town, try to throw him off a cliff. Why would folks get bent out of shape over a passage of Scripture about the coming Jubilee of God? Why? Why have the people of God never observed Jubilee? Well, I think we all know why, don't we? You know why. I know why. Because if there's forgiveness going around, somebody's got to do the forgiving. If there's debts being forgiven, somebody's missing the income from the payments. If there's land being returned, somebody's having to return it. Prisoners being freed, somebody's crying out, justice isn't being served. Captives returning home, but, but this, is, this is our land. Our ancestors won this fair and square. Somebody somewhere, when Jubilee is coming, somebody somewhere is losing something, and that somebody somewhere is always somebody in power. 
Somebody with more than enough to go around. In other words, when there's talk of jubilee, it's good news, it's joy for those who have nothing to lose. But for anyone else, it's anything but. Could it be that the reason jubilee has yet to arrive is because there are so many of us who claim to be the people of God who refuse to let it happen? Is it possible that those of us who sing the songs of Christmas, who sing hymns on most Sunday mornings, who quote passages from Leviticus, Isaiah, and Luke, are holding back the dawn of the day of the Lord? Could it be that those of us who call on the name of Christ are the very ones who seek to throw him off a cliff at the mere mention of Jubilee? On this third Sunday of Advent, a Sunday marked by the theme of joy, there's so many in our world who are longing to experience it. And during this season, we may be tempted to pursue our own joy as we gather with friends and family, as we take vacation, as we receive gifts, as we spend money. But what if this season isn't about pursuing our own joy? What if joy isn't something that we're supposed to take hold of and keep for ourselves? What if this life isn't only about pursuing our own joy? What if as the people of God, this season and every season hereafter is really about pursuing the joy of others? What if the ancient practices of Jubilee are more than just a novel idea to be interpreted away as ancient hogwash? What if forgiveness was about more than a promise from God to us? What if liberation was more than just some spiritual notion? And what if joy, what if joy is truly found in bringing good news and joy to others? We have a week left, one week leading up to Christmas. May you, the people of God, in this week, be bearers of the good news of God's coming joy. May you be proclaimers of God's coming jubilee. And may you seek the joy of others this season. For it's only in that pursuit, the pursuit of others' joy, that we find the deepest and truest meaning of joy itself. And may we as the people of God on this day begin to pronounce, proclaim, and realize God's coming jubilee. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, in this season, when we use words like joy, may we understand, God, that it is not a possession for us to take hold of. But rather, Lord, as your people, it is a command to go forth and share. And even, Lord, as you began your ministry with a proclamation of jubilee, of the coming day of the Lord, may we begin this day looking forward and proclaiming that coming jubilee when you will set the world right side up in liberty, and freedom, hope, love, and reconciliation are made real in the hearts and minds of all of your people. So Lord, be with us now. Show us ways even this morning we can begin to be heralds of the good news of your coming jubilee. And give us the strength, God, to be your people who make it happen. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.